What's up guys, welcome back. I'm Joe Youngblood. I'm a Whitetail Habitat designer with Whitetail Habitat Solutions alongside Jeff Sturgis, Dylan, and Kevin. I hope you guys are doing well. Wanted to continue our simple series where we just pick out one simple topic, go over it how we think about it often in our habitat plans and, and maybe how you guys think about it as well if you're implementing your own plan or maybe we've already visited you. But today we wanted to talk about food plots. Um, we can probably talk about this topic on and on and on, but I wanted to pick out some main things. Hopefully you guys grab one or two that uh, are gonna help you in implementing yours. Um, but to start off, location. Location, 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 right? Uh, very important. Um, there's numerous things when it comes to location uh, and what we need to think about it when it comes to a food plot. As far as access to start, if you guys don't have uh, proper access where you can get around the food plot and not spook the deer, then that's probably not a good spot for your food plot. Um, we always consider the food plot to be included in our sanctuary and if you guys are busting the deer out, they are going to be gone for quite a while and it's going to be detrimental to your hunting. Um, so definitely think about your access, how you might need enough room going into our next uh, part being size. If you don't have enough room to screen and, and do the proper stuff that you need to to move around the food plot, then um, also not going to be great and it's really going to hurt things when you're trying to get around there and get to your tree stand or blind. And also when it comes down to size, kind of an important topic would be the fact that it's nice to have the ability to possibly expand the plot if necessary. I ran into this personally visiting a couple clients recently um, where they had, uh, some had fields where they would be easily able to uh, maybe remove some of the screen, add to the plot, and kind of redo the screen, especially if deer numbers prove to uh, continue, or maybe they keep wiping out the plots and they need to uh, make that plot bigger. And also ran into some clients where, um, you know, they have quite a bit of work to do as far as clearing goes and expanding the plot would then be quite a bit more difficult. You know, bringing a dozer or a forestry mulcher back in to have to expand it, make sure you get enough sunlight, redo the screen uh, in possible areas where soil isn't as good. Um, and that's one thing I didn't put on here, but, you know, soil pH, even though uh, that should not dictate where it goes, uh, it will dictate how much lime you need to put on and how much work uh, would need to be added if you had to, do it to expand the plot. Uh, neighbors, as long as you guys are screening okay and the food plot is not right on the border, uh, especially if your neighbor, you see their access right along your border and things like that, that is usually a good area where you should also possibly have a path to access and your food plot be far enough away from that where you can properly screen it and with anyone walking by and trying to be fairly quiet where they would not spook the deer on your plot. Uh, bedding, um, when it comes to relation to other items in your plan, uh, food needs to be far enough away from bedding uh, so that we have that depth of cover. Now, don't mistake me, we do need bedding closer to food for the dough and things like that, but that will be more towards the inside of your property, away from your access, enough that we can create that depth of cover and have additional bedding so that when we get far enough back, we have a different assemblage of stands, morning stands, evening stands, and we have enough room for all of the bedding to house does, young bucks, mature bucks, and that sort of thing. So all of these pieces do come together and it's and it's very important. Food type. A lot of questions on these. Um, you know, we have some of the blends that we typically use, especially when it comes to no-till, like the buckwheat and things of that nature. But for your fall food, um, I want you guys to pay attention to whether you have any summer spring food and whether you, of course, don't. Uh, and if you do have it, um, you know, how are your doe numbers? Do you have a very large doe herd where you need to take that away? Um, or is your doe herd uh, or just herd in general really lacking and you're trying to attract more deer uh, over to your property? Maybe in more big wood settings um, where there's just not quite as many deer, they're more spread out. Uh, the food type is going to come into play. Uh, also, having something for the deer that's going to last through multiple parts of the season. If all of your food goes brown early season and, and it's done in October, um, you have no rye or anything or some of the brassica bulbs um, you know, looking good later in the year, well then your late season might be uh, um, a little lackluster. So pay attention to that. Make sure you guys have that diversity. When we talk about our plots, we often talk about splitting them down the middle, whether half is corn and you split the other two pieces into a, a green blend and a brassica blend or, or something of that nature. All the food should be the same in each plot even if the sizes are different so that the deer aren't going to be picking and choosing what plot um, you know, is going to be better at different times of the year and really affecting your hunting strategy. 
Uh, if you guys are getting pictures on camera on one plot and then you start to hunt that at opportune times, which is probably pretty selective, and they end up switching to another plot, you're going to be quite bummed uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt things. Shape. There are, of course, many different areas and, and properties that have all sorts of different shapes, so food plots, therefore, are going to be uh, in different shapes. Um, when we are paralleling food plots, we talk about trying to keep deer along our borders on our property, especially during daylight, as long as possible. So we have linear plots, we have, uh, of course, larger plots um, that are going to uh, be considered more of a holding plot. We have plots where uh, maybe it's helping round an edge, keeping deer on your property. Of course, I always tell clients, deer are not going to move in a perfect circle, right? They're not going to stay on the property. They're not going to follow that red line that we create round and round and give you tons of opportunity. But whether they are coming from in the property or off the property, hopping onto some of these, these movements, um, the shape of the property can really help guide the deer, make a corner or stay just a little bit longer um, on your property, giving you more opportunity at, at those big bucks that you might be looking for. And lastly, uh, topography guys. We need to keep in mind not only erosion, but also when we plant these seeds wiping right off of the hills. Uh, we are typically looking at putting that food on some sort of flat spot, whether it be higher in the topography range or lower, uh, maybe where it holds a little bit more moisture and things like that. But again, that is something that's going to come into play around all of our assemblage when we look at bedding, when we look at access, and um, when we consider topography and finding the best spot for our plots. But it is something you need to be aware of. You don't want to spend that time going to try and do no-till and spray and really uh, be in an area where that seed is not going to stay alongside uh, too much slope and things of that nature. So. Um, that's all I really wanted to cover for food plots today. I know, again, there's many, many things that we could continually talk about when it comes to food plots and the process and chemicals and all sorts of stuff. But if you get additional questions, you have some pointers, things like that, you want to throw them in the comments below, please do so. It's been um, a little while since I've been to my own farm. We're here in May and uh, I really need to, as, long, as well as everyone else, pay attention to when we're going to do that first spraying of glyphosate and 2,4-D. Um, but at least for my area, things are very, very wet. We just got another almost inch of rain. Um, I have some recent pictures where it looks like even my woods that is primarily dry are basically underwater. So it looks like we'll have about 10 days or so of really warming temperatures, some well into the 80s actually. Um, and that's going to dry things up, hopefully allow us to have uh, a hard enough surface to get that ATV back there and get the spraying done that we need to. So. Uh, look forward to bringing you guys there, doing a little more videos on the farm, and uh, we will see you next time.